What's this rubbish? <laughs> What's this rubbish, she says. That there is the secret to our success. Welcome to Watch Mojo, and today we're counting down our picks for the top 10 Harry Potter questions that were answered in the book. No permission form signed, no visiting the village. That's the rule, Potter. All those with permission follow me. For this list, we're going over the unexplained plot points from the Enchanting series that were fully explored on the page. If there's a wizarding question we magically left off our list, please take your quills to the comments. Not really, though, because it scratches up your keyboards and phones. Number 10. Why does the defense teacher always change? Audiences probably notice that Hogwarts School of Witchcraft and Wizardry has quite a lot of turnover with its staff. Now, we have two changes in staffing this year. At least it does with one particular position, the Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher. Harry, this is Professor Quirrell. He'll be your Defense Against the Dark Arts teacher at Hogwarts. Oh. Nice to meet you. Every single year Harry Potter attends the school, there's a new person doing the job. And they do not stay for long. Fame is a fickle friend, Harry. Celebrity is as celebrity does. We've seen professors die, get amnesia, be revealed as imposters, and more. This phenomenon all comes down to he who must not be named. Are you out of Moody? Are you? No. As Dumbledore tells Harry in the Half-Blood Prince book, Voldemort once applied for the position. When Dumbledore denied it to him, the Dark Lord put a curse on the job. But if we're being honest, most of them deserve to be sacked. Fearfully fascinating subject. Not that you need it, eh, Potter? <laughs> Number 9. How did Harry know Lupin and Tonks had a son? It's the side characters who get the real short end of the wand in the movies. During the final battle, Harry uses one of the titular Deathly Hallows to speak with his departed loved ones. One of the departed souls is his former Defense Against the Dark Arts professor Remus Lupin. During their conversation, he mentions Lupin having a son. And Remus, your son. Others will tell him what his mother and father died for. One day, he'll understand. However, this information about his fatherhood is only slightly referenced but never fully explained in part one. By the way, wait till you hear the news. Remus and oh, I can't wait. We'll have time for a cozy catch up later. The seventh book features a scene where Lupin asks Harry to be his son's godfather, but the eighth film only has a deleted scene where the former professor talks about his son with Tonks while Harry's not around. You shouldn't have! It's Teddy who needs you. He'll sleep till dawn and snore like his father. Number 8. Why is Harry allowed to go to Hogsmeade? Starting from their third year, Hogwarts students are allowed to visit the local village Hogsmeade for weekend trips. These visits to Hogsmeade Village are a privilege. Should your behavior reflect poorly on the school in any way, that privilege shall not be extended again. However, they need permission from their parents or guardians. Harry's family doesn't sign off on his field trips because he turned his aunt into a human balloon. This forces him to sneak into Hogsmeade through secret passages and while under his invisibility cloak. Harry! <laughs> Bloody hell, Harry. That was not funny. <laughs> but in later films, Harry has no problems visiting the village the normal way. In the books, it's clear that Harry's godfather Sirius Black signed the permission form the boy who lived needed. It's odd that the filmmakers didn't just explain this with a quick couple of lines of dialogue. If you signed it, then I could go. I can't. Only a parent or a guardian can sign. Since I am neither, it would be inappropriate. Number 7. How can Fred and George afford to open a shop? The Weasley family aren't well-to-do wizards. It's not much, but it's home. While they may live in one of the coolest houses in the world, they're still quite poor by magical standards. So it probably surprised a few viewers to see that Fred and George managed to establish a joke shop on Diagon Alley in the sixth film. Step up, step up, we've got fainting fancies. Those bleed new guards are just in time for school. Puking pastels. But how did they get such prime wizarding real estate? Well, Goblet of Fire neglected to mention that the winner of the tournament got a cash prize. Trust me when I say these contests are not for the faint-hearted. But more of that later. Since Harry inherited tons of money, he gave the winnings to Fred and George. Their burgeoning business wouldn't have been possible had Harry not reached the cup that fateful night. Number 6. Why couldn't Harry see Thestrals earlier? Harry Potter has been haunted by death since an early age. That's why the Thestrals in the fifth movie left viewers scratching their heads. What is it? 
the swamp. That? Pulling the carriage? Since these creatures can only be seen by people who have watched someone die, Harry should have seen them earlier. He was in the room when his mother died and watched Professor Quirrell turn to dust in front of him. However, both events were depicted differently on the page. But why can't the others see them? They can only be seen by people who've seen death. He was in his crib while Voldemort killed his mother. And Harry also passed out before Quirrell died. While you could argue that he should have been able to see them after Cedric's tragic end, the books made it more plausible why he couldn't view them earlier. Number 5. How did Dumbledore find the first two Horcruxes? I have stolen the real Horcrux and intend to destroy it. During the sixth film, Dumbledore lets Harry know that Voldemort has multiple Horcruxes. These sinister items contained pieces of the Dark Lord's soul and helped him cheat death. Part of your soul that is hidden lives on. In other words, you cannot die. However, the movie never delves into how Dumbledore figured out where the ring and locket horcruxes were or why Voldemort chose those items specifically. It'll be a little secret. The book details that both items have ties to the Dark Lord's family. Dumbledore found the ring in a house that belonged to Voldemort's relative. And after reviewing the Dark Lord's life, the headmaster uncovered a cave the evil wizard used to visit. These small details explain how Dumbledore found two of Voldemort's most important possessions. Number 4. How did Barty Crouch Jr. escape Azkaban? One of Goblet of Fire's biggest reveals is that Barty Crouch Jr. has been impersonating a dark arts professor this whole time. Barty Crouch Jr. I'll show you mine if you show me yours. Before this reveal, we saw a memory of him being sent to the legendary wizarding prison Azkaban by his father. Hello, father. You are no son of mine. However, the film never explains how Crouch Jr. got out. No one's ever broken out of Azkaban before, and he's a murderous, raving lunatic. The book explains that his father brought his dying wife to Azkaban. She then switched places with Barty Crouch Jr., while Mrs. Crouch died while disguised in prison. Barty Crouch Jr. was imprisoned and controlled by his father for years. The films also don't mention that the Voldemort follower received the Dementor's kiss later on. Maybe knowing that his soul was sucked out might have been too much for viewers. Number 3. How did Voldemort's followers find the trio? One would think the three experienced young heroes would be better able to hide themselves from Death Eaters and Voldemort's other minions. Nice meeting you, Mr. <laughs> However, during the first of the final two films, the trio is repeatedly found by the villains. But these incidents aren't just about bad luck. Well, don't hang a bell. Snatch him! In the book, Ron reveals that You Know Who has put a taboo spell on his own name. The Dark Lord reasons that Harry and others who rebel against him aren't scared of saying Voldemort's name. All right. Voldemort. Voldemort. So, anyone who speaks his moniker aloud will have their location instantly made known to Voldemort and his followers. It turns out that Harry's bravery was his undoing. Number 2. Where did the two-way mirror come from? In the two Deathly Hallows films, Harry suddenly acknowledges that he has a shard of a mirror that lets him reach out to other people over great distances. A reading heart. It's a curious thing to keep in your sock. This item becomes a crucial plot element because it leads to the heroes being rescued from Malfoy Manor. Help us. However, we never actually see Harry receive the mirror in the films. The final film just explains that it belonged to Sirius. Who gave that to you? The mirror. Madungus Fletcher. About a year ago. Dung had no right selling that to you. It belongs to Sirius. But those who read Order of the Phoenix know that Sirius gave Harry the mirror so they could easily communicate. I wanted you to have this. Admittedly, leaving the mirror out of early films explains why the young hero didn't try to confirm that his godfather was kidnapped by Voldemort in his fifth year. The mirror omission might have actually helped the narrative. What's life without a little risk? Before we continue, be sure to subscribe to our channel and ring the bell to get notified about our latest videos. You have the option to be notified for occasional videos or all of them. If you're on your phone, make sure you go into your settings and switch on notifications. Number 1. Who are the Marauders? In the third film, Harry is introduced to the Marauders map. 
this magical document was created by Mooney, Wormtail, Padfoot, and Prongs. So you mean this map shows everyone? Everyone? Everyone. Where they are, what they're doing, every minute of every day. Brilliant! But the identities of this group weren't fully fleshed out in the films. While the connection is never made on screen, the Marauders are James Potter, Remus Lupin, Sirius Black, and Peter Pettigrew. Remus? Sirius? My old friend! <laughs> the failure to explore their identities unfortunately leads to several weird plot moments. In one instance, Harry insists the person who conjures a stag Patronus must be his dad, since his map codename was Prongs. It was my dad who conjured the Patronus. Harry, your, your dad's... Dead, I know. I'm just telling you what I saw. The boy who lived also refers to Sirius as Padfoot out of nowhere. He's got Padfoot at the place where it's hidden. By not defining the Marauders, the filmmakers definitely managed to stir up some plot mischief. Mischief managed. Do you agree with our picks? Check out this other recent clip from WatchMojo, and be sure to subscribe and ring the bell to be notified about our latest videos.